The Falcons reported the training camp today. What are the biggest stories and questions we hope get answered over the next six weeks? You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back, everyone, to another illustrious episode of the Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Term supply. So, if you don't know me, I'm your very humble host, Aaron Freeman. Been covering the Falcons for a lifetime, formerly at Falcons.com. R.I.P. You may also know me as Mr. Drew. AKA Sirius Black, AKA the Jolly Green Giant, AKA the Iron That Sharpens the Iron, AKA Mr. AKA. And of course, I appreciate each and every one of you that is an every day of this podcast that makes it your first listen, first watch each and every day. And if you want to become an every dayer, then go strong with me. All you got to do is subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts to get the latest episode as soon as it is available. So today, the Falcons. We're among the last teams in the NFL to report to training camp. Players checked in today. They will begin their practices tomorrow. And today I wanted to kind of set the table for what the coverage here on Lockdown Falcons is going to look like for the next six weeks as we gear up for that week one action against the Pittsburgh Steelers, right? And we'll talk about some of the biggest stories that we'll be following over the next six weeks between now and then in training camp. And the reality is like the, the big stories in training camp aren't – that big, right? You know, because when you look at the biggest stories and the biggest unanswered questions for the Falcons in 2024, right? The probably the first two that come to mind is sort of how much Kirk Cousins and Zach Robinson, the new quarterback, the new offensive coordinator, are going to be able to elevate this offense. And then the third one is, you know, surrounding the defense. Like, is it going to be a quote unquote good enough defense that's going to allow them to win the games that they need to win this year? Or You know, is this going to be a defense that's going to, you know, hold this team back from reaching, you know, their postseason goals? And the reality is we won't get answers to any of those three questions between now uh, and and September 8th. Right. We have to wait to see September 8th what we're going to see, because, you know, whatever glimpses we get of Zach Robinson's offense in training camp is going to be the most vanilla, most basic version of that offense. And, you know, obviously vanilla basic offense is not going to get you to the postseason. So we're going to see a big step up, hopefully, come September when it comes to that. And then we're probably not going to see that much of Kirk Cousins, at least in the preseason, right? And and he'll probably get several days off as he's working back from that Achilles uh, injury and and sort of on a pitch count in practice in the the day. So we won't really know what Kirk Cousins is all about, uh, you know, over the next six weeks. And then when we talk about the defense, what have we been talking about for months? It seems like it's all about the pass rush. And, you know, you can't really glean a whole lot from practice when it comes to pass rush uh, outside of padded practices. And then even then, like, you know, what what are you going up against? And then then it's like the preseason game. It's like, all right, well, you know, like, are you going to see any of the starters in some of these preseason games? And probably not, you know. It's like when we get to week two and we're, we're facing Lane Johnson and Jordan Mailata, right? You know, that's really what you want to see with this pass rush do against arguably the best pair of tackles in the NFL. You know, that's very different, you know, trying to beat those guys in Philadelphia than it is, you know, beating Roger Rosengarten or Patrick Paul, the two rookies in, in Miami and Baltimore uh, that you'll have to face potentially in the preseason. So, you know, if that's the case, like if, if none of the big stories are really going to get answered over the next six weeks, like what are we going to talk about here on the podcast, right? And it's going to be a lot of roster battles. It's going to be a lot of camp competitions, right? And we do have a couple of starting spots up for grabs. And so that's really kind of the big stories for training camp that we'll discuss quite a bit. You know, that outside cornerback spot, strong safety, slot receiver, potentially nose tackle, weak side linebacker. Is that position up for grab? And we've discussed all of these positions at various points over the last two months. But to me, the thing that stands out about these positions for me, and there's one or two exceptions in this. But like it feels like to me, like the person who's going to win these competitions probably is not necessarily going to be the long term answer at that position. It's really just, hey, who's going to be the stopgap? Who's going to be the bridge option at some of these positions for this year? Because it's 
very possible that the Falcons next offseason are looking to upgrade these spots with more of the long-term answers. And you look at the outside cornerback spot. Obviously, fan favorite Clark Phillips, the second-year corner for the Falcons. You know, is he a long-term answer at outside corner? Maybe. I, I tend to be a little bit more skeptical because if he is, then he's going to be pretty much an outlier when it comes to the NFL, when it comes to being an outside corner in terms of size in, in his frame. Strong safety, where we have DeMarco Hellams going up against Richie Grant. You know, Grant's a free agent after this year. You know, even if he does win the starting competition, how how good does he have to be in order to earn a second contract from the team, which is probably really, really good. And, you know, I don't know how many people are expecting that from Richie Grant. And then DeMarco Hellams, it's like, you know, is he a long-term answer? Like, maybe if he proves to be the second coming of Keanu Neal. But, you, you know, I don't know how many people think He's going to be on that level as a player this year. Slot receiver, Rondell Moore versus Ray Ray McLeod. You know, if, if Zach Robinson wants more of a Cooper Cup type of slot receiver in that role in the future, long term, you know, a guy that can block, that can get open, that aren't isn't just a quote unquote gadget guy. Like, I don't know if either one of those guys are long term answers. Now, nose tackle, you can say, yeah, if LaKeel London or Zion Logue, those guys are both young enough that you could imagine them carving out a long term role over multiple years if they win the starting spot. That's not the case for, you know, Mr. Eddie Goldman, who's re retired like 15 times in the last four years. Uh, you know, he's just a stopgap at this point in time. And then that brings us to weak side linebacker where you got Troy Anderson, Nate Lamon. Now, this is where, to me, the exception, right? But as I've said many times over the last six months, like, I don't think you really want this to be a competition. You really want Troy Anderson to be the starter because he's just going to bring so much more upside and value to your defense. Uh, with his athleticism and his ability to, to match up against tight ends and spy quarterbacks and, and whatnot. And Nate Lemon, as good a run defender as he is, and he's a plus run defender, we've talked many times in the last six months that he's kind of a minus in coverage, right? Um, and, you know, I know you guys get tired of me talking about Nate Landman and Clark Phillips' limitations right now, you know, because I am a hater, right? But, you know, they were day three picks in, in an undrafted free agent for a reason. And I know you're probably sitting there saying, Aaron, well, you know, there, there are several day three picks and undrafted free agents that have had success in the NFL. And, and yeah, you're right. There are several, but they tend to kind of fit a particular pattern, right? Uh, the players that I think of that fit this paradigm are Richard Sherman, Cam Chancellor, right? Guys that moved a bunch in college, right? Played different positions in college and never really settled at one spot, but were plus athletes, got into the league and were able to blossom in the, you know, the sort of right spot. That's really what Troy Anderson is, right? You know, played quarterback, running back, linebacker in college, plus athlete, settles in that. And then other examples of, of you know, those undrafted free agents, Damon Harrison, Malcolm Butler, you know, Matt Judon and whatnot, you know, guys that were good in college, but played at really small schools, like Division II schools. And teams tend to overlook those guys and say, like, we're going to bet on the Power Five guys in the early rounds and we'll wait on the, the Division II standout uh, in that regards just because of the belief, you know, that is a better bet to bet on the guy that's done it against quality competition. And, you know, all my SEC fans out there, you know, understand where that uh, sentiment comes from and, and would agree with that sentiment. So, you know, I don't know if Phillips and, and Lamon really fit that paradigm of guy of the next Malcolm Butler as the next, you know, Matt Judon or wh whatever you want to call it, um, because they have athletic limitations. And so, you know, you can say, Athleticism is overrated, and, and sometimes it is, right? Not every good athlete turns into a good NFL player, but almost every good NFL player is a good athlete, right? There are some outliers, but very rarely, right? And, you know, if you want to bet on outliers, by all means, be my guest. But, you know, good luck <laughs> putting an outlier on Alvin Kamara or Travis Kelsey. See what happens, right? As they say, falcon around and find out what happens when you, you try to match up, you know, Nate Lamont against uh, uh, Travis Kelsey. So um, we'll find out a lot about a lot of these players uh, in these positions over the next six weeks. But, you know, to me, most of our pressing answers about this team are not really going to get answered until September 8th. And so it's just like, hey, we just hang out, you know, for six weeks. We'll talk about some roster battles and all that stuff. But, you know, it's, you know. I, I say all that. That's what we're going to do here on Lockdown Falcons. But I know so many of you guys are out here like, you know, look, Aaron, that's maybe what you're doing. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to read every single thing into the what happens in practice and preseason uh, because, you know, it is a preview. Right. That's what pre stands for. It's a preview of the upcoming season. Right. And it's not. Right? These next six weeks are really about figuring out which 53 guys you're going to carry on your roster. And we'll break down that further as we continue today's Locked on Falcons. 
Guys, it is summertime, which means baseball is king, even though football is working its way back. And if you want to get back in the ballpark, you know, because you're not going to be able to spend your afternoons or your mornings, I guess, sweating in that Georgia heat at training camp this year because of all the construction going on. So why not spend your afternoons sweating, uh, you know, out there <laughs> at the ballpark? And you could do so with game time is taking the guesswork out of buying tickets as an authorized uh, major league uh, baseball ticket uh, distributor. And whether you're into baseball, soccer, other sports, comedy, music, theater, Game Time has got you covered. And my favorite feature to Game Time is the, the seat views, right? You get that panoramic view from your seat before you buy. You don't have to worry about hidden fees at checkout. Game Time is taking the guesswork out of it. All you got to do is download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL, and you'll get twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On NFL. That's L O C K E D O N N F L for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So I think one of the more common mistakes that I, I see from a lot of fans and, and to a lesser extent media is that they, again, think the pre and preseason stands for preview of the regular season. And they treat it as such, right? The pre is means it precedes, you know, it comes before the season. And if you want to preview some of the biggest stories around the sports landscape of course check out lockdown sports today free 24 7 sports streaming channel on youtube or the free amazon fire tv channels app but this time of year you know it's really about figuring out who are the 53 guys plus you know 16 practice squatters uh that are going to make your roster that's going to help you win games during the regular season and barring injuries when i sort of look at the roster right now the falcons uh 90 man roster as it stands today or 92 because i don't know who they they cut today to add the two players that they signed today um but you know i my count is about 39 players that i think are pretty much locks to make the team right where we would sit here and say like their chances of making the roster is like 98 percent or higher right you know we can't really go 100 percent for anything because crazy things happens all the time in the nfl but you know i'd say it's like 39 locks and then like five guys that I think are near locks where I would say their chances of making the roster is like way over 80%, somewhere in 80, 90% range, right? And so that leaves about nine roster spots up for grabs. And it's interesting that that number is as low as it is, given that we have a new coaching staff, which we've discussed throughout the offseason, which is, you know, I've been critical of because it to me suggests that there's a level of complacency in Atlanta that I don't necessarily love, but it does speak to the commitment that you know they believe that Terry Fontenot and company have already built a very capable roster and they've only really re revamped a couple of positions quarterback wide receiver tight end and d-line um and er elsewhere has pretty been minimal changes to the roster and i was thinking about this you know the other day which is like i imagine if we had retained Arthur Smith and Ryan Nielsen and company uh the, the old regime that you probably would have seen quarterback, wide receiver, and D-line revamped as well. And the tight end, they probably would have stayed the same because, you know, Arthur Smith loves some John o. Smith. But, you know, I think that's why over the next six weeks, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about third-string roster battles, right, in addition to the handful of starting spots up for grabs, talking about the, the nine spots that are really sort of up for grabs, and then, you know, really talking about evaluating some of these players and, and how ready they are. But, you know, that's going to lead to a lot of people being like, you know, buzzing about player X and how he looks in practice and how he's going to have a breakout season, which is fine, right? You know, I think you, this is the time of year where you can assess and evaluate individuals, but you got to stop short of evaluating units, right? As so many people often do, where they'll look at one or two drives in the preseason and say, our offense was able to do X in the preseason. That means they're going to do X for the 180 plus drives that they're going to have in the regular season in the same applies for the defense. And that's just a wrong perspective to have, right? Especially something I stress every year when it comes to the preseason. Preseason, you're getting vanilla versions of every team. The Falcons are going to be vanilla. The Dolphins are going to be vanilla. The Ravens are going to be vanilla. The Jaguars are going to be vanilla. Every team is going to be vanilla. They're not game planning for each other. So these games are not sort of, you know, microcosms of potential what you're going to see in the regular season, right? Classic example of that is you go back to last summer. The you know, preseason game against Cincinnati where we played the starters. Everybody went gaga over that one drive from the, the Falcons starting offense in that game. And I infamously came on the pod the very next morning was like, eh, meh, didn't move me. And of course, you know, because I'm a hater. But the reason why was because like, you know, Matt Collins 
catching, you know, a couple of quick outs is, you know, is not somehow unlocking this super dynamic offense. I know I pick on Matt Collins a lot, but it was just, it was ridiculous to me how people got so excited about, you know, he, he caught it like a two yard out pattern. Oh my God. He's going to be incredible this year. It's like, really? Like, and then with Desmond Ritter, you know, we talked about this throughout last summer, which is like the three things I wanted to see improvement from Desmond Ritter was improved accuracy, his ability to operate in the red zone and his ability to hit the deep ball. Right. And I think he did have a deep pass to Drake London on that drive, but that drive ended with him throwing an inaccurate red zone interception. And so it was like, you know, this is not what I wanted to see. Now, granted, I didn't expect Desmond Ritter to show me all the things to check all those boxes on one drive. Again, it's preseason. Who cares? But, you know, it's 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 basically the preseason is about doing the basic stuff that your offense and defense requires, right? And that's especially true for the young and unproven players, right? Another example from last summer, Jalen Mayfield, right? Another hater, uh, player that I constantly hate on, right? But you remember he got that 77 PFF grade after the, the first preseason game against the Dolphins, and everybody was like, oh, my God, he's he, he's he's back. He's ready. He's he's ready to be the swing tackle. And we talked about it very extensively on this podcast that he got that high grade because of his run blocking. But the reason why the run blocking looks so good is because for one drive in that game, the Falcons just basically went hard on running duo and inside run plays, which is exact blocking scheme that Jalen Mayfield played at Michigan. We didn't have questions about his ability to fit in that blocking scheme. We had questions about his ability to fit in the Falcons blocking scheme, which was, you know, going hard on the outside zone scheme. And he didn't necessarily have the athleticism. He didn't really show that he was better at doing that, you know, last year than we thought he would be, not to mention how much trouble he had against Emmanuel Ogba in pass protection in that game. And, you know, again, people thought I was just hating, which I was. I wear that badge prou proudly. But, you know, we saw the next couple of weeks, which I talked about, you know, after that Dolphins game that, like, you know, against Cincinnati and Pittsburgh, and it didn't look good, right? And he wound up getting cut. Um, and I, I bring that up to, because you need to understand what you're looking for, right? Instead of just, like, looking at a PFF grade and being like, this guy's good or, or whatever, you need to understand – what you're looking for. And for example, when it comes to our outside zone run blocking scheme, I need to see you to, to know that you can operate in the scheme and, and thus be a guy that we should keep on your roster. You need to be able to execute the reach blocks or, or climb to the second level and be that heat seeking missile to take out linebackers, which is a staple of the outside zone run scheme. So for example, if we're talking about Matthew Bergeron, what type of jump he's going to make in year two, right? The three areas I want to see for Matthew Bergeron improve this year, if, and when he gets on the field, which, you know, he may or may not, because who knows if, you know, Raheem's going to play the starters. Um, but the three areas I want to see him improve upon is the ability to execute those reach blocks, which he struggled with last year, his technique and hand use uh, in pass protection, where he was too often punching with both hands last year. He needs to punch with one hand uh, that, you know, two hand punches is a absolute no, no in the NFL. And then his ability to handle and anchor against power, right? Those are the three areas I want to see improvement from Matthew Bergeron. And if he shows improvement in those areas over the course of the summer, you know, we can get, we can start to get really excited about year two. If not, then we're going to potentially falcon around and find out when he faces Cam Hayward and Jalen Carter and Chris Jones in the first three games of the season. And so as these next six weeks unfold, you know, we'll probably get more into the nitty gritty about these individual players and what they need to do in order to for us to get excited about them. Um, but, you know, especially for the veteran players like. You know, these next six weeks, it's just not really about evaluating them. It's really about preparation, right? Those guys, if you're an established player that's been in the league for three to five years, you have a guaranteed contract. Or in the case of guys like Kirk Cousins and Grady Jarrett and Jake Matthews, you've been in the league for 10 or 12 years. These next six weeks, you're like you know you're on the team. These next six weeks are really about you prepping for week one, for September 8th against the Steelers. They, these are pros, pros, right? You've been around the block before. And so we don't really care what you do in the, in training camp in the preseason, because you have a process that you've now done for three, five, 10, 12 times that you know how to get ready for that week one matchup. And depending on how you count it, I think the number of players that sort of fit in that sort of category of being pros, pros is probably as low as 15, maybe as high as 25, depending on how you want to count it, depending how many young guys you want to include in that list uh, that haven't been necessarily in the league for three to five years. But then for the, the other guys on the roster, on this 90-man roster, these guys are looking to establish themselves. They don't know if they're going to make the team, and so they need to put their best foot forward. And so if you're in that category, we do want to see you you know shine in some of these practices and preseason games. And you know 
really that's kind of what this time of year is about right for those 65 to 75 guys that don't know they're going to make the roster that aren't pros pros like it's sink or swim time right and so are you good enough to stick and that's really what this is all about not really this sort of preview of the upcoming season so you know if you can focus on the individual and understand what you're looking for yes i think you can glean a lot during this time of year and you know we'll be doing our best to share with you that insight over the next six weeks and that will be an ongoing conversation here on this illustrious podcast but we'll wrap up today's illustrious podcast and today's conversation talking about the latest pickups along the offensive line you know the falcons profit has struck again uh but do i'm wondering a little bit if the signing of new offensive tackle julian davenport is a bad omen for what's to come with the falcons offensive line and i'll explain that as we wrap up today's locked on falcons Now, passion, drive, patience, it is the winning formula for winning championships, and it's also what's going to keep your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, and you'll always find what it, exactly what you're looking for. With eBay Guarantee Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash, baby. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car an MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guarantee Fit, only available to U.S. customers. So before we wrap up today's Locked On Falcons, I want to let you know what's in store for you tomorrow. We'll be joined by Jarvis Davis. We'll get his reaction to uh, day one of training camp. I won't be on hand at training camp. You know, I'm just going to be chilling in the AC, guys, not sweating it out in that Georgia heat, you know, because if if I if I was, I would, I would pull an Eddie Goldman. And I'd be like, yep, I'm done. I'm retired, guys. It's it's too hot. I can't do it. But we'll get Jarvis's thoughts on it uh, tomorrow on this episode, and we'll follow that up over the next six weeks with several guests to come on that will be on out there sweating it out in the heat to share their insights into this game. But let's talk about the Falcons signing uh, Julian Davenport, their offensive tackle. They signed both him and Zach Bailey. We'll talk about Zach Bailey in a second. Davenport is interesting to me. He was most recently with the UFL San Antonio this past spring. He was originally a fourth round pick with, uh, with the Texans in 2017. Uh, he did play in 2019 with the Miami Dolphins and 2020 with the Dolphins and uh, the Falcons current offensive line assistant coach, Sean Flaherty was an assistant there. And you may recall around the beginning of June last year, we talked about the Falcons, you know, targeting ex Dolphins that, you know, played in Miami in those years when Flaherty was there as future options for them at swing tackle last summer. Right. You know, because the old regime tends to sign players that they know, and it seems like that trend has continued with the new regime now that Raheem Morris is here. And, you know, since I talked about that, the Falcons have added three former Dolphins, right? Isaiah Prince, you remember him, right? He was the first swing tackle option at the beginning of the season before the Falcons ultimately settled on Storm Norton. They just picked up a UFL pickup from Jerry Jones Smith, Pitt legend, also with the Dolphins back then, and now Davenport. And Davenport is an interesting player. He's a big guy, 6'7", 36 and a half inch arms, 98th percentile for an offensive tackle. You don't see very many guys built like him, which is one of the reasons why uh, Houston took a flyer out on him back in the fourth round back in the day. But he hasn't really quite developed when he's gotten opportunities on the field. And usually Davenport's presence on a roster is usually a bad omen, right? Because he began his career in, in Houston and Miami, right? And in those first two years in Houston, in 17 and 18, Texans gave up more sacks than any other team in, in the league. The Dolphins led the NFL in, in sacks allowed in 2019. Davenport started a bunch of games in those years. He gave up a bunch of those sacks. And he's bounced around in the league since then. Uh, played, you know, I think he was with the Colts in 21 when the, their offensive line was still good. You know, 22 was the disaster year for the Colts. So he got it out of there. But, you know, he was with the Bears in 22. I think the Cardinals in 22. The Giants last year. Those have not been the greatest offensive lines in the NFL the last couple of years. And so that's why I'm like, is it a bad omen? Like teams that usually sign Julian Davenport are usually really desperate uh, on the offensive line. And, you know, maybe this is, you know, an off color remark, but the analogy that I'm thinking of, it's like 10 minutes before the bar is closing, you know, or the club is closing and, you know, you're trying to, you're trying to go home with somebody and it, your standards drop at that point. I mean, that's kind of what Julian Davenport has been throughout his career, but maybe, maybe he turns things around. 
uh, this summer with the Falcons. So it just makes me a little wonder a little bit just because, you know, I already had a little bit of concerns about the Falcons offensive line depth, especially on the interior. Um, and it's like, what do we do? What do we do? <laughs> right. So it does make me a little nervous about, you know, why is Julian Davenport here? He, he like bad offensive line play usually falls Julian Davenport around. So that, that does make me a little nervous, but I don't know if Julian Davenport is going to be an option on the interior. Right. You don't usually see six, seven guards in the NFL because, you know, low man wins and, you know, trying to block six, two and six, three D tackles usually is not going to go well for the six, seven guy. Uh, the Falcons did sign a guard today in Zach Bailey. He was an undrafted free agent out of South Carolina back in 2019 with the Bucs. He did make the Bucs roster that year as an undrafted free agent. I think he did get hurt that year, so he didn't play a snap for them uh, later in the season. He's been on like five different practice squads since 2020, the Bucs, Vikings, the Colts. Uh, Washington, I think last year he was with the Chargers. Uh, he played one game with the Chargers in 2022, played on special teams. Uh, he did start out in Tampa Bay as a guard. Uh, he did play the last couple of years. He's played more tackle. He did play mostly guard in, in college at South Carolina. He did dabble as a tackle. So I think because the guard position is much more of a question mark for the Falcons, we assume Storm Norton's got the swing tackle spot locked down, although, you know, maybe this is a sign that the Falcons don't have as much faith although they did resign him. So, you know, maybe they're just looking for another offensive tackle, you know, a fourth tackle uh, in the mix, uh, which is why they keep bringing in these new tackles. But, you know, we think Ryan Newsom has got the center spot locked down and it's just really a question that backup guard and Javon Gwynn, Kyle Hinton, maybe Zach Bailey could throw his name into the ring and, and potentially emerge there. Uh, he's generally, at least in the preseason, has, you know, graded out well, according to PFF. Uh, but I haven't gone back and, and watched, you know, Chargers preseason snaps from last year. But, you know, clearly the Falcons are a little bit concerned about that tackle depth, right? That if you want to count Bailey as a fourth offensive tackle, you know, he's the fourth or as an offensive tackle, he's the fourth offensive tackle they've signed since June 1st, right? They signed Andrew Stubert, who also has some guard experience, Jared Jones Smith, as we mentioned before, Julian Davenport, and now Bailey. So, you know, I, I it's, it's it's interesting. That's all I'm saying. Like, you know, I'm going to be a lot more concerned about the offensive line depth than the rest of you guys. I, I know you're just you're, you're chomping at the bit to see, you know, Clark Phillips lock down Ray Ray McLeod uh, in some of these practice clips um, and, and how exciting it's going to make you. But, you know, I'm going to be sitting here just like, hmm, you know, we might have to devote a daily third segment uh, of every day. It's like hmm, offensive line depth. What's going on with this? As we discussed earlier this summer, where it's it's going to matter because there will be injuries. It's 90% probability that there will be at least one game where you're going to lose a starter uh, d due to an injury uh, on your starting five. And, you know, you don't want it to be the game where you got to block Chris Jones is basically what I'm saying, <laughs> or Max Crosby is what I'm saying. So offensive line depth is going to matter uh, quite a bit this year. So we'll see. I don't know as I'm recording this who the Falcons cut to, to free up the roster spot for these two guys. I'm assuming it's probably the, you know, UDFA, Ryan Cole, and, and maybe it's another offensive lineman that they've picked up. Uh, but we'll sort of have to see, you know, as the Falcons churn their roster. Uh, but so I just find out after I just stopped editing. So through the power of editing, I just learned that the two players that the Falcons cut uh, were backup punter Ryan Sanborn and Ryan Cole, the undrafted free agent, as I suspected. Disappointing to see Ryan Sanborn get cut, just because, you know, to me, it's, we'll, we'll, we'll probably get into it later, but I do, like, I don't think there was, Sanborn was the player that probably had the least odds of making the roster, but there was a part of you that wanted, like, okay, this is plant to see for the future, because I don't know if Bradley Pinion's going to be here next year, because it'll, it'll be interesting to see how Pinion adjusts to the new kickoff rules, because, um, Basically, the main reason why the Falcons sign Pinion is because he can kick, kick touchbacks consistently. And with the new kickoff rules, that skill set is not nearly as valuable as it used to be. So we'll see how Pinion adjusts to it. But part of me wondered, you know, if the Falcons would be making a change at punter, not in this year, but in 2025. And someone like Ryan Sanborn, you know, theoretically, you could have stashed on the practice squad if he had a good summer uh, to 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 potentially be your heir apparent at that position. So um, there, those are the two moves that the Falcons made to free up room. That is going to do it for us here tomorrow. We'll be joined by Jarvis Davis, giving his recap of day one of that Georgia heat, AKA training camp. Uh, you know, <laughs> I will not miss it, uh, but make sure you stay tuned uh, as your first listen. All you got to do is subscribe and follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts, guys. Uh, we'll be back with much, much more. It's going to be a fun six weeks, 
especially if, if you love a third string roster battle, ooh, 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 locked up Falcons is the place to be, right? So check us out. Make sure you check out Locked On Sports today, Locked On Sports Atlanta. You know, there's other things going on in Georgia and Atlanta sports. Check out Locked On Braves, Locked On Hawks, Locked On Bulldogs. It's all part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.